You're listening to a programme from BBC Radio 4. This edition of Profile is presented by Mark Coles. 12, 11, 10, 9... Fasten your seatbelt, helmet on. On Profile this week, we're looking at an entrepreneur, a wannabe space traveller and Star Trek fan whose online explorations have already changed our world. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Someone who watched the moon landings as a child and more than 40 years on has just salvaged from the ocean bed the very engines that fired mankind to the lunar surface in the first place. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. A man who, according to those who know him, is... Galactically smart. Extremely competitive to the point of ruthlessness. Funny ridiculously ambitious. He's a bit of a mystery. He is what I would call a cutie pie, a Martian also. A man whose laugh is so loud it can probably be heard on the moon. <laughs> yes, we're talking Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon.com, the online multi-billion dollar retail giant which is changing the way we shop. To some, he's a pioneer. To others, including some small traders who reacted angrily this week to a fee increase to use his network, he's a villain. A modern-day take on Bond baddie Blofeld, a balding, evil genius, stroking, in his case, not a cat, but a dog named after a Star Trek character. Boldly going where no bookseller has gone before, plotting the downfall of the bricks-and-mortar retail universe. There's always been somebody who comes along who upsets the status quo. Everyone will tell you that Jeff Bezos is the smartest person that they know. Jeff Bezos is on another planet. So let our journey, our mission begin. Captain's Log, Day One. Despite his Star Trek obsession, Jeff Bezos was actually born on planet Earth, Albuquerque, New Mexico, to be precise, on January the 12th, 1964. His parents' marriage lasted less than a year. When he was four, his mother remarried Miguel, or Mike Bezos, an immigrant from Cuba. Fame and fortune ran in the maternal side of his family. Jeff's grandmother was related to country music star George Strait. But it was his grandfather, Pop, a former rocket scientist, who fired Jeff's early imagination. Richard L. Brandt, author of One Click, Jeff Bezos and the Rise of Amazon.com. Jeff Bezos, when he was young, would spend every summer at his grandfather's ranch and they would fix tractors, take care of the uh, cattle. You had to do everything for yourself. And I think that was a big inspiration to him. I think it made him feel as though he could accomplish anything he wanted to. Before long, Jeff had commandeered his parents' garage and turned it into a laboratory. He was always tinkering with things. He tried to take a Hoover vacuum and create something of a hovercraft by reversing the flow of the vacuum. He just tinkered on all kinds of things. I think most of them didn't work. And when he wasn't inventing, he was, yes, you've guessed it, rushing up on teleportation. Watching Star Trek on TV. I used a large portion of my elementary school free time hours not only watching Star Trek <laughs> but also playing Star Trek. The computer was fun to play because people would ask you questions and you know, they say computer and you'd say working. <laughs> Jeff Bezos laughing and talking at the American Academy of Achievement. Clearly a young achiever himself, he was sent to a school for gifted children where he dreamt of building hotels and amusement arcades in space. Miami Palmetto High School's then Director of Student Activities, Andy Massimino, was convinced he'd go far. He had just about everything. He had the personality, he had brains, he had a good work ethic, and you just knew he was going to be successful. After school, he went on to Princeton University, got a degree in computer science, and wound up working for Graciela Cicholnisky, the then head of telecommunications startup firm Fitel. He is what I would call a cutie pie. He's a very sweet person. I always thought of him as a Martian. He had this 
extremely bright eyes, very large eyes, which is what you think of a Martian. You know, this big head, big eyes, and he had he was very thin. Of course, there was much more to him than just big eyes. He was very unique in the sense of never getting hung up. I think Jeff is a very, very positive person. He just wants to get the job done. After further jobs with Wall Street investment firms in May 1994, researching business opportunities on a newfangled thing called the internet, Jeff Bezos had his eureka moment. It was simple. He'd used the internet to sell books worldwide. With three hundred thousand dollars, his parents' life savings in his pocket, he headed for Seattle with his wife. When they got there, the first thing they did was hire computer programmer Shell Capen. It was basically just me showing up at a house where there was not even a completed office in a garage. Had to pretty much do everything from scratch. At the beginning, it was just. Me and Jeff and a couple of spreadsheets and some ideas about what we were going to do. One early investor was venture capitalist Nick Hanawa. When he said、uh, that he wanted to start an internet retail business, I said that I wanted to be the first investor, and eventually I was. How convincing was he then? He, he was passionate about this. Was he books sold via the internet was going to be the future? Well, he was. Persuasive to me, but we were two of the only people in the country who agreed with us at the time. He and I shared the thesis that it was going to be huge and transformational. But as obvious as it looks today, most people thought we were crazy. Amazon.com launched on July the sixteenth, nineteen ninety-five, the same day, twenty-six years earlier, that Apollo eleven had set off for the moon. Within thirty days, Amazon was selling books right across the U.S. and in forty-five foreign countries. Jeff and Shell Capen working flat out to get the books packed and posted to customers. Pretty much everyone did some time in the warehouse, such as it was. It, it was actually a basement room that was a rock band practice room. No windows and a low ceiling and a door that was spray painted with the word "Sonic Jungle" on it. And at first, the packing occurred on the floor because we didn't have even tables in there. So it took a little while before we got smart enough to get tables. <laughs> By the time Eric Best joined, towards the end of the 1990s, things had really taken off. Amazon now had 10 million customers worldwide, though desks were still something of an issue. On the first day that new employees joined, they were issued a desk. The company was big enough that employees no longer built their own desks, but the desks were made out of solid wood doors that the company picked up at the local hardware store. And it was very important to the company that they were demonstrating to employees living a frugality theme as they were building the business. Frugality was one of six core values emblazoned on Amazon banners. Another was customer obsession. There was a lot of conversation that happened in the hallways about customer ecstasy, and this idea of customer ecstasy kind of driving all of the decisions. Mostly, I would say I remember it as a very frenetic blur. It just kind of built and built and built. There was really a visceral sense at the company that this was an arms race. The company made a huge bet. They took on, I think it was almost two billion dollars in convertible debt at a time, and so there really was a huge vision for what Amazon would become, even in those early days, and a willingness on Jeff Bezos's part to go out and take risks. In 1996, the Wall Street Journal featured Jeff Bezos on its cover. In 1999, Time Magazine named him its Person of the Year. But for Shell Capen, the ensuing publicity changed things. After a while, this sort of relentless press of publicity and fame did begin to affect him to some extent. I think it created some distance between him and other people in the company. It became clear that if the company really succeeded, he was going to be the rock star of it, and that was just going to be the way it was going to be. Others point to what they call a more ruthless side. There were accusations of poor treatment of workers in some Amazon warehouses, and Richard L. Brandt found that although some staff remained loyal, others didn't get on with Bezos. A lot of people find him very, very difficult to work with. If he doesn't want to hear what you're saying, he just sort of waves his hand in front of your face and、uh, says,、uh, "That that's enough. I'm I'm going on to something else." 
Today, Amazon employs 70,000 people, turns over $48 billion a year, with Bezos worth $21 billion himself. But it's been achieved at considerable cost to traditional high street stores, many of whom equate Bezos with the Elzebub. Amazon investor Nick Hanauer again. Well, we at Amazon.com made a hell of a lot of money in the process. There are obviously a lot of other people who, who lost a lot of money, and it's hard to argue that the world is a better place without lots and lots of independent traditional bookstores. I, for one, am sad that many of them are gone. But this is the nature of technology. And it's technology where Amazon is increasingly heading, with things like cloud computing and electronic devices, Kindle and Kindle Fire. So what's Bezos doing with all the money he's making? Engine start. Well, not surprisingly, given his childhood infatuation, he's heading into space. Vehicle is confirmed in saving mode. All right. Woo! Deep in West Texas, away from the public eye, Jeff Bezos has bought 290,000 acres of land, built himself a spaceport, and through his secretive space tourism company, Blue Origin, is testing and designing a new generation of spacecraft. Space journalist Leonard David. To me, we're at a historic moment. Uh, you're seeing something akin to Wright Brothers-like experimentation where we're going to see rocketry not be so complicated, not be so expensive. Will Bezos be able to fulfill his dreams? His granddad was a rocket scientist. He watched the Apollo 11. He wants to be an astronaut. Will he get up there in the end, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, Bezos is probably doing his exercises and, and making sure he keeps his weight down. He's ready to go. For an entrepreneur who's made his name tapping into the now, analysing data and watching trends, it's the long-term future that seems to fascinate him. He may have changed the way we shop, but now Jeff Bezos wants to change the way we think about time, to create an icon for long-term thinking. Working with inventor Danny Hillis and musician Brian Eno, among others, he's funding the construction of a vast mechanical clock deep inside a Texas mountain, a clock that will keep time for the next 10,000 years. It'll tick just once a year, apparently. It's cuckoo only coming out to mark a new millennium. It's cost Bezos $42 million so far. The stated aim, to do for thinking about time what pictures of the Earth taken by Apollo astronauts have done for our view of the environment. Robert Spector is author of Amazon.com, Get Big Fast. His love and obsession and interest in space travel, I think, already has devoted a lot of his money. But I think he's a husband, he's, he's a father, I think as you get older and you look at your legacy beyond just business, he may not be Bill Gates, but he does have about $20 billion in his bank account that he could uh, you know, do some very nice things with. Amazon may have changed our present, but with mountain clocks, space travel and who knows what next, Jeff Bezos is bidding for immortality. He may have the last laugh yet. <laughs> That edition of Profile was presented by Mark Coles and it was produced by Ian Muir Cochran. And a reminder that there are many more Radio 4 news and current affairs programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.